questions. My name is Maeve Ryan and I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of War Studies and the co-founder, uh, co uh, co-director of the Centre for Grand Strategy. Um, it is a great pleasure on behalf of the Centre for Grand Strategy to welcome you all to today's event. Uh, the purpose of today's event, of course, is to think about where we are with uh, diplomacy in Britain, uh, with the state of British diplomacy, um, the fitness for purpose and machinery and, uh, and a British foreign policy too. Um, and this is very much in the spirit of what we do at the Centre for Grand Strategy. We're very interested in this uh, broad kind of mission to inject a greater degree of historical and strategic expertise into British uh, statecraft, diplomacy and policymaking. That was our mission statement. And delighted to welcome today um, three distinguished speakers to help us think about this question about where is British diplomacy today? It's been a year since the Integrated Review has been published. Obviously, quite a lot of uh, major events in that time, and not least the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, but, but many other things too, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, this, uh, the signing of the AUKUS agreement, um, a number of different changes, uh, to say the least, in the European security architecture since the invasion of, uh, of Afghanistan, um, the merger of, um, of course, um, uh, uh, the FCO and um, DFID, uh, and all of the, um, the changes that have happened as a result of that, um, uh, and, and many, many more things too, both in the kind of the wider international strategic context, but also domestically within Britain as we start to grapple with um, some of the long-term effects of the COVID crisis um, uh, and various other things. So to think about what all this means, um, uh, we have three members of, um, uh, th three very distinguished um, uh, speakers. We have, I'm going to introduce them in the, in the sequence in which they'll be speaking. We have, first of all, uh, Tom Fletcher, who's the principal of Hartford College, Oxford University. Um, uh, Tom has previously served as foreign policy advisor to uh, several prime ministers, Blair and Brown and Cameron, before becoming ambassador to Lebanon and a visiting professor at NYU. He's written a number of books, uh, including Naked Diplomacy, Power and Statecraft in the Digital Age, and Ten Survival Skills for a World in Flux, uh, with a number of other things worth coming to. So uh, welcome to you, Tom. We also have Lord Peter Ricketts, who is a visiting professor in the Department of War Studies. Um, he's 40 years of experience as a member of the, of the diplomatic service, and his final post was as ambassador in Paris in, uh, from 2012 to 2016. He's also, before that, the UK's first national security advisor and the coordinator of the 2010 uh, uh, Security Strategy and Strategic Defence and Security Review. Um, he's permanent undersecretary of FCO and head of the diplomatic service, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of things to say uh, about many of the things we have today. So welcome to you, um, Peter, as well. And finally, we have Suzanne Rain. Uh, sorry, I've actually got, I think I've got the sequence of this slightly wrong. Suzanne's going to go second, uh, and then um, uh, Peter will go third. But uh, Suzanne served also in the Foreign Office from 95 to uh, 2019, and this included uh, postings in Poland, Iraq, and Pakistan. Uh, her specialism has been counter-terrorism, including a number of senior domestic appointments, uh, including head of the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre from 2015 to 2017, and Director of Counter-Terrorism from 2017 to 2019. Um, she's affiliate, an affiliate lecturer at the Centre of Geo for Geopolitics at Cambridge and a trustee of RUSI, the Imperial War Museum and Stop the Traffic. So welcome to you all. Um, we're going to have a fairly traditional format here, about 10 minutes or so each um, for some remarks from our speakers. Uh, and then we'll be opening up to questions. So please do use the question uh, um, function and, um, and uh, as your speakers are posting some, or, or, or offering us their comments and hopefully some provocations, uh, please do think about your questions and, and make sure they're nice and difficult. Uh, one thing just to flag is that this session will be recorded. So please be mindful of that. Um, and with that, I will say no more and I will pass over to Tom. Tom. Thank you so much, Maeve, and uh, it's great to have the chance to have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Suzanne and Peter and really and to getting into the, uh, the really fun bit, the, the, the questions uh, later on. So I'm sure it's going to be a terrific uh, conversation. Um, I thought, I mean, to be fair to our current uh, diplomats who often can't be here to speak for themselves, I think we have to recognise the challenging context in which they are operating uh, at the moment. Uh, challenging global context, challenging UK context, and then a very specific challenging context for the organization uh, itself. If you look at the, the global context, and you mentioned uh, a few of these uh, dimensions, but if you go, if you look at COVID, Kabul, Kyiv, we really are experiencing the implications of a driverless world. And we've seen through that period of the pandemic, what happens when countries resort, not just to social distancing, but national distancing. And diplomacy is much, much harder in periods of austerity and introspection, periods of, of nationalism, uh, when 
you don't always have enemies that you can find easily on a map or, or kill in a Bond film. And I think we've seen that really over the last couple of decades. It's not a particularly political uh, point about this administration. Uh, and I go back to the 2008 crash uh, when I was working with Gordon Brown in, in number 10. At the end of that G20 summit, when we tried to put the system back together again, Barack Obama, relatively new at the time, said that unless we fix the international system, then the next crises will be much worse. And of course, in the subsequent decade and a half, we failed actually to rebuild that international system. So that's a very challenging global context, even before you throw in the, the Trumps and the Putins, effectively Trump orphaning the international system and, and Putin vandalizing it. Uh, and then you look at the UK context, and there are particularly challenges there, I think, uh, for the FCDO as well. We have been in recent years uh, a little bit too Trumpy in what is now a Biden world. Uh, in the period after Brexit, uh, and this is not just a, an anti-Brexit or a, an anti-Remain comment, I think we, we assembled a, a circular firing squad uh, as, uh, as the UK. And, and at a time when the rest of the world was looking at us very closely, we had real scrutiny in that period. Uh, I, I fear that we lost our treble A rating for competence. The rest of the world looked at us and thought, I'm not so impressed by this lot uh, anymore. And I think, you know, in the last few years, added to that has been a slightly hubristic mismatch between reality and communication. Uh, and so at a time when we're going around saying that we want to be trusted in the world, uh, we're actually threatening to break international law. At a time when we say we want to be a soft power superpower, uh, we're trashing institutions such as the BBC, which are so essential to that soft power. Uh, and at a time when we are claiming to be global Britain, we are cutting our aid budget. And I think that makes it very, very difficult uh, for the FCDO. And then the final set of challenges then, really more specifically for the organization itself. And it's an organization that I, I think all three of us uh, uh, have worked with and, and admire and are you know, very much uh, part of. Um, but they've, they've faced particular challenges in the recent period. They've not been blessed, I don't think, uh, over a number of years with ministers who, who really rate the organization or, or will defend it or will deploy it effectively and who will challenge it in the right ways. The Foreign Office likes challenge. It likes to be told, Here, here's the problem to crack, how do we crack it, now go off and do it. And I'm not sure that's necessarily happened to the extent that it should in recent years. I think the organization has without doubt suffered a period of, of low mojo. And uh, we could trace this back to Iraq maybe, we could trace it through Afghanistan, through the uh, EU referendum. But often decisions taken elsewhere have actually ended up costing the FCDO reputationally. And there's a cumulative effect to that for the diplomats that we send out into the world. And I think added to that, there's a challenge around public reputation. Uh, I think the public and the, the media can't quite decide whether they dislike the FCO because it's full of Sir Humphrey characters wandering around the world eating Ferrero Rocher chocolates or whether they dislike it because they see it as, uh, as incompetent, out of date, uh, slightly more Mr. Bean than Sir Humphrey. But somewhere between that, there's a failure to really connect with people's day-to-day -day needs and explain why the FCDO is essential to Britain's security, prosperity, and, and values. You know, as a result, you'll be unlikely to find anyone marching down Whitehall uh, in support of, of the Foreign Office, in support of, of more resource for the FCDO. I might touch later on, if, if, if it's of interest, uh, on the review that I led in 2016 of the FCDO, or FCO as it was then, which um, was the, the first post-internet review, really, uh, of, the, of the Foreign Office. And we found lots of strengths, the people, uh, the agility, you know, a global network which was genuinely envied by most diplomatic services and, a, and a, a sense of how to use that network and how to deploy soft power alongside uh, hard power. But we also found that the organization was stretched, uh, that it was still too male and pale, uh, that there were too many diplomats in the UK and too few uh, overseas, that it was still struggling to ensure that the technology worked for it and that it didn't work for the, uh, for the technology. 
Uh, and we worried that it was still, at key moments, slightly risk averse and not always great at executing. It could often have the idea, but wasn't always great at seeing through the idea uh, over a period. I think if, if, you, if you look at it now, six years on, I think you do see much greater uh, agility and they took key decisions to go for agility rather than secrecy, including around the way that uh, capitals, the capital communicated with its uh, embassies and, and ambassadors. I think you've seen a brilliant uh, decade for the promotion of, uh, of women leaders in, in the FCDO and you know, Peter was very much part of that uh, and subsequent permanent secretaries as well. So that now, I mean, I did a map recently of, of the countries in the world led by one of our brilliant women, um, where the embassy was led by one of our brilliant women diplomats and you know, the, the map was, was dominated. And I think that's been a huge uh, step forward. I think if you look at an issue like crisis leadership, and of course, we can argue about individual crises and, and, and the pressures that individual teams were under. But you know, over two decades, three decades, crisis leadership, uh, consular work has been absolutely transformed uh, in the FCDO. Uh, and I think still it is attracting talent and promoting talent. And I think you could turn up in any capital in the world and find absolutely brilliant diplomats working there. But I still worry, you know, is there a really is that vital sense of purpose really clearly defined for the organization? That was my slight worry uh, with the review in 2016 was that ministers at the time didn't really want to define what the sense of purpose should be for the organization. I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure we'll come on to that. I think the, the, the marriage with, uh, with DFID creating the FCDO hasn't always been a happy one from both perspectives and there's work to be done still to work that through. I still fear that there is that lack of mojo you know, if you go into a lift in King Charles Street, are people talking about uh, their concerns over terms and conditions or the difficulty of getting to work that day? Or are they talking about what do we do next on Putin? What do we do next in Afghanistan? I worry it might be still more of the former uh, than the latter. And I, still, I also worry that the Foreign Office can do more still to really stake its claim in Whitehall in a, in a post-Brexit, um, post-Trump uh, world. So I would love to see the FCDO, and I hope this conversation can be part of that, really reconnect with that magnetic sense of collective purpose, which is what many of us were attracted to when we joined the Foreign Office and what it really represents uh, at its best. I hope it can succeed in helping the country have a worldview based on actually having viewed the world rather than having viewed a small corner of, of Whitehall and, uh, and, and Westminster uh, or a, a constituency. Uh, you know, if the Foreign Office didn't exist, we would be thinking now, how do we invent it? Uh, the, the challenge is really, how do we reinvent it? Uh, and, and how do we help it to really defend its corner more effectively? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tom. Um, and seamlessly, we'll pass over to uh, Suzanne. Thank you, Maeve, thank you, Tom. Um, that was a really great start. And I think, I thought I was going to say lots of provocative things, but maybe they're not going to be as provocative <laughs> as I fear that they might. Um, Maeve gave us a sort of a set of sub questions and I'm not going to answer all of them, but I'm going to answer the ones that, that I've been thinking about since, um, since leaving the civil service. And I'll start with the question about the process of making foreign policy. So is the foreign policy apparatus capable of securing its priorities is diplomacy sufficiently well coordinated? And may start in the introduction with the, the integrated review as being a sort of thing which explains that. I've written before several times during the last year that for me, the, the mistake with the integrated review is a mistake that reviews like this often make, which is that they focus on the subject matter, the what, rather than the how. And that means that when the subject matter changes, everybody immediately says, oh, now it's out of date. So the question now is, did it tilt too far to the Indo-Pacific, just as the discussion in military circles is, um, what does Ukraine tell us about what materiel we need? Do we need to buy this instead of that? And in fact, the debate needs to be about how we get better at anticipation and decision making. And I wish that the integrated review had focused about more on security, defence, development and foreign policy, how, how it is made, um, how the thinking is done. And that point reaches across government as a whole. I strongly believe in the importance of investing uh, 
in analysis and assessment at the expense, if necessary, of policy staff. Although, in fact, I don't think it is a resource issue. I think it's a question of structure and planning. So for me, if you're talking about the leadership of the Foreign Office, the direction of the Foreign Office, one of the first questions the leader of any organisation should ask themselves is, how does this organisation think? And if you're responsible for foreign policy, then the question is, how do we think about foreign policy? And how does our thinking join up with everybody else in government who's thinking about foreign policy? And where do the actual decisions get taken? And, and that, I don't think the Foreign Office really asks itself that question enough, or, or government asks itself that question enough. And, and so then if you ask, you have asked me to think whether FCDO is responsive enough or too responsive, and I think it's both. It can be very slow to shift, and then it can get immediately distracted. And I think it should be asking what investments and reorganisation need to take place to ensure that it's more responsive to surprises, or, mu or much better, and I believe this is, this is possible, to be surprised less often. It is possible to create a system which is monitoring, prioritising and warning and which, which enables an organisation to keep its poise. And I think the Foreign Office just keeps losing its poise. Um, and it would mean prioritising thought, esteeming the analysis, sometimes over policy, and coordinating across departments so they don't any longer have a situation where FCDO seniors get one set of briefing and seniors in another department get a completely different story and then they will have an argument somewhere in the cabinet office. That it, it should be better than that. And, and we want to be able to be surprising, to take the initiative, to, to take preemptive actions. I've written recently about um, surprise being seldom valued very much in statecraft. Often, often we're averse to it. You know, when when the AUKUS deal happened, everyone was horrified. Like, how can we have how can we have done something that surprised the French? But actually, sometimes the answer has to be to have the confidence to identify what we want and to pursue it, to decide who we want our allies to be, and to be constant with them. And in an area, in an era of um, of state competition, it follows that to gain competitive advantage, a state needs to be good at surprising competitive states and managing the risk that it in turn might, might be surprised. And I think as well that this requires us to see the world quite starkly. I think history shows a tendency in FCDO to optimism in its judgment of situations, which means that we don't often, often enough anticipate risks to make sure they don't materialise. So I would be more pessimistic and, and be bolder about acting preemptively. And then my second observation, I'd be really interested in Tom and Peter's views on this because they were at the heart of this, is about um, what foreign policy is anyway nowadays. I'm going to talk about the effects of the war on terror because uh, I was part of that. The accusation has been made many times over that we were distracted by the war on terror and that put us off making proper foreign policy. I obviously disagree. Firstly, 9-11 and the wars that preceded it and followed it were and continue to be a significant part of global affairs. They called forth, however, a national security response. And the shortcoming was that that response became defence and security more than it was diplomatic. And what do I mean by that? I mean, the Foreign Office was there, but, but not really there. And it styled itself in support of the kinetic effort, but didn't really esteem the, the kinetic effort all the time. And because of that, it somehow, the diplomatic process somehow got divided from the main effort. So for me, I couldn't really see the significant diplomatic effort on the Middle East, on Kashmir, on Afghanistan, in, and I'll go on, I'll just explain a little bit more about why. Um, the machinery in h &G up to that point had been split between overseas, foreign, and defence policy, and you had this thing called the Overseas and Defence Committee, which sort of pulled it all together, and the, the view was generally that overseas meant diplomacy, meant the Foreign Office, and, and then defence was defence. And then 9-11 happened and a, and a number of new and important actors emerged who were acting in this landscape of national security, the agencies, the Home Office, 
nor enforcement agencies, the National Crime Agency. And it was no longer possible to say that this was just defence or just diplomacy. And I, I think that that was when FCO, now FCDO's problems really started to crystallise, when we started to have a national security policy rather than just a foreign policy. And, and I'm really interested in Peter and Tom's views on that. But that, I think, really shook up the architecture. And the Foreign Office struggled to hold the centre ground because other actors either propelled themselves or were propelled into policy roles. And that was matched by um, the development of really serious actors in our key ally countries like America, who were essentially counterparts of defence and the agencies. So suddenly, the ambassador no longer owns the critical relationships, for example, in the US. Um, others were engaged in regional diplomacy. So um, if you look at Iraq, I mean, it was basically run by CENTCOM. It was generals who were doing administration on the ground. And defense did a huge amount of diplomacy, as did the agencies. And of course, for me, the war on terror was fundamentally about diplomacy, because one of the main protagonists the US was our closest ally. So at the heart of the 20 years of war on terror has been a really close state on state dynamic. And I don't think we recognize that enough. And so individuals adjusted. There were some incredibly strong and effective senior diplomats who held the ring and some brilliant ambassadors and more junior staff who, who saw that new reality. But the department as a whole was left out of position. And embassies struggled because diplomacy wouldn't and couldn't and didn't solve it on its own and some em embassies define their role as, as facilitating others but but what what the fco didn't do didn't put aside the time to say what is our usp in this new era and and i think that there was there was a failure to really make the space to imagine or identify the real diplomatic task during those 20 years um, and, and I think, if you think, what, how, did, how did all that happen? Um, I think it was easier to treat national security in the military, as, as a military issue um, rather than a diplomatic one because the enemy was a non-state actor. And yet the enemy operated within states and conflicts are driven by beliefs and national identities and local power dynamics. So just as now with Ukraine, states had different interests at play for example pakistan india iran all had significant interests tied up in the face of afghanistan and as players they made a greater contribution to the eventual outcome than al-qaeda necessarily did and it's unfortunately obviously we know this it's common for states to support terrorist groups as an additional means of achieving their own foreign policy objective something which iran has perfected so the war on terror was was never as simple as a series of military operations against a non-state actor. And the West's failure was one of diplomacy. It didn't esteem the diplomatic wraparound to the war on terror as it, as it ought to have done, as it could have done. And it is, of course, the, the case that many of the non-states have more consistent long-term strategies than the UK, US or Europe. I'll just leave that out there. So for me, the lasting consequence of the war on terror for diplomacy was not that it was a distraction, but the, the opportunity wasn't taken during that time to really design a new way of integrating diplomacy into a national security effort. We could have made so much more of it. And I hope it's going to be easier to do this in the case of the war in Ukraine. And clearly there's a massive effort on that at the moment, which is terrific. But going back to my earlier comments, I hope that we don't make the mistake of thinking that the war in Ukraine is, is the only issue we need to deal with. Um, and then finally, just one word on aid and foreign policy. Uh, I know this is controversial, but I do think we need to be hard headed about how we build alliances. The war in Ukraine has shown us that assumptions that we make about loyalties can't be relied upon. So the UAE in particular, I think, have surprised us um, with their position. But more broadly, the UK and the US chose not to contest Chinese and Russian influence, particularly in Africa. And we chose instead to have a foreign policy that was, that was values based. And we had an extraordinary and laudable development policy, which was about giving to those most in need. And we consciously did not set out to instrumentalize the aid. And this is, of course, morally right. But 
it is striking how little impact we have had in building enduring alliances with those people and those states that we have helped the most. Our aid has not delivered the kind of influence in swing states which China and Russia have been able to buy. In, and, so, and then I did a little piece of research myself. Um, in 2020, the UK provided £14.5 billion of official development assistance. And if you look at the top 20 countries which received bilateral ODA in 2020, I'll just list them very quickly, Ethiopia, Somalia, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Syria, South Sudan, Sudan, DRC, Lebanon, Myanmar, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, India, Kenya, Uganda, Nepal and Jordan. How many of those supported the vote in the UN to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council? Six of them voted outright against the motion, i.e. against suspending Russia. Twelve abstained. Only two of those top 20 that we gave our overseas development, uh, official development assistance to, only two voted to suspend Russia. And those two that voted against Russia were Myanmar and DRC. So I think we need to have a mature conversation about this, not the kind of polarised conversation that we always end up having about aid and influence. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you very much, Suzanne. There's lots in there, um, very thought provoking. And we'll pass over to Peter now before we get to the discussion. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I will keep it brief because uh, I do want to leave time for questions. And there's been two very good and challenging and rather brilliant presentations so far. Um, to which I'm not sure I can add a great deal. First of all, I agree with Tom that those who are in the public service at the moment deserve real credit for six incredible years, really, starting with the Brexit vote. Um, I don't believe that they've been particularly well led, but I do think they've been heroic in their professionalism and, frankly, their stamina as well. Um, I was critical of the integrated review, not because it lacked lots and lots of good ideas, and creative thoughts about how Britain could be great after leaving the EU, but because it made no choices and it seemed not to recognize that there were real limits as to our resources and our capabilities. Um, and as Tom said, a rather hubristic kind of strand of we were going to be a soft power, superpower, a science and technology superpower and lead the world in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and I don't think it proved uh, all that integrated. Um, and development policy, I think, is, a, is an example of that. I think it was um, very, very bad timing to try to fuse the FCO and DFID and at the same time uh, make a four billion pound cut in the aid budget at very short notice. Um, and that cut did fall disproportionately on humanitarian aid, on health, uh, on uh, programs for women and girls and so on. Um, and we've seen a big exodus of development talent from the department as a result of that. Uh, I mean, I found the international development strategy put out recently, frankly, rather thin. And while I think Suzanne's challenge is a very good one, uh, I'm not sure that instrumentalizing our aid in the hope that we would buy votes in the UN against Russia was ever going to be a policy that would get us very far. And I do think that Britain's part of Britain's soft power in the world was a reputation for being a serious development power that had thought deeply about development and recognized that improving global health and reducing poverty was actually in our interests as well in a hard headed way. Um, and I think the pandemic rather brought that home. So I'm not sure I agree with Suzanne entirely. I do think we should have a sensible conversation about how our aid is targeted. But I'm left with the impression now that the purpose of it is to serve short term political goals. Um, anyway, we'd come back to that perhaps in questions. Um, life itself has solved the issue of what really is global Britain all about? What really are our priorities? Because I think it's now absolutely clear that European security has to be front and center and number one. And I don't think we've begun yet to understand the whole implications of Putin's barbaric war. I mean, we can see. Um, obviously strengthening of NATO, even today with Finland and Sweden joining, uh, that is a global strategic benefit for NATO and a setback for Russia. Um, but there are many, many, many more serious questions emerging as well. 
in case I sound too negative about the Foreign Office, I think that the whole government response to Ukraine has been very impressive. Uh, the intelligence community got it right. Uh, the defense reaction has been good all the way through. And I think the FCDO has been impressive in the way that they've organized sanctions coordination, even at a time when we have still a dysfunctional relationship with the EU. Uh, so uh, I think that that has been uh, a crisis where Britain's strengths in foreign policy have come through. Um, and I think we are now in a new world, frankly. The Madrid summit today is going to introduce a wholly different NATO approach to deterrence of Russia. Uh, we are into a period, I think, structurally of more defense spending, of uh, a larger role for defense in foreign policy, national security policy, just coming to Suzanne's point about what is it all about. And I think there are some really important longer term questions, which I hope the FCDO is leading Whitehall thinking on. Um, we are not going to manage the outright defeat of Putin. We are going to be left coexisting on the same continent with a hostile Russia that will not settle for a peace settlement, that will continue to harbor revanchist ambitions, certainly as long as Putin is in power and quite possibly beyond. How are we going to manage that when there are differences of approach in Europe on that? Uh, what about the global south? As Suzanne was saying, uh, many countries chose not to see uh, what Russia has done as a particular uh, threat to their interests, although it is, if Russia is undermining the rules-based order, creating an energy crisis and a food crisis. There are some serious questions there, I think, about uh, the dialogue we need to have with countries beyond uh, our region, that this is not just back to the, the same old east-west squabbles that they've seen in the past. Have we got the bandwidth in the FCDO to also be thinking about the next crisis and the one after that? Uh, China and Taiwan, I mean, there is absolutely no excuse for Western foreign ministries not being prepared for uh, that to turn into a absolutely uh, major crisis, potentially even uh, a military attack on Taiwan. Are we thinking about what the energy crisis means in the longer term? New partners, uh, a long-term policy of trying to deny Russia uh, profiteering from its uh, uh, oil exports, but a whole series, I think, of really important long-term issues where the FCDO ought to be, and I hope is, in the intellectual leadership of Whitehall. Um, and so just a word on structure. Uh, you would expect me to say this perhaps, but I think the National Security Council is the answer to what you were saying, Suzanne. Absolutely, foreign policy is far beyond uh, what, the, what the FCDO can handle. Indeed, it's far beyond government. I mean, anyone who has sat as an ambassador anywhere abroad knows that um, the totality of the UK's relations with every country goes far beyond what the government can control. Some of the most important and interesting aspects of the relationships are economic, financial, cultural, sporting, uh, and all the rest of it. But for the governmental area, there is a very wide sweep of issues which come under the national security label now, and all of them touch on foreign policy. And the National Security Council should be the right place where Whitehall comes together on that. Uh, in the first two or three years, it was actively chaired by David Cameron, was the place where decisions were taken, where coordination was achieved between the ministries. I think it may have lost a bit of mojo uh, in the years since then. I hope it is being used to look at the kind of issues that are now front and center because of the Ukraine crisis, because they are long-term structural shifts that we need to address, as well as the constant succession of crises that come along. Incidentally, on crisis management, uh, I think that it was an exceptionally difficult crisis for the FCDO to manage in Afghanistan in the middle of August. Nonetheless, uh, I think it did show up problems of uh, foresight and of leadership, particularly political leadership, but the FCDO has got to be absolutely um, at its top game on crisis management, given the uh, unpredictability and disruptive nature of uh, uh, what the world is throwing to us at the moment. So I would like to see uh, the NSC uh, thinking ahead uh, to pick up your point about strategy, Suzanne. I think governments are bad at strategy. Um, politicians are obsessed with what is happening today, uh, even within the next hour. It's got to be a forum like the NSC that can look ahead, that can look at the analysis, the horizon scanning, the foresight. Absolutely, we should be hard-headed. We shouldn't um, uh, be too uh, Pollyanna-ish about what's happening in the world and always hope for the best and assume that, uh, that the worst won't happen. I think Ukraine has been a very, very sharp reminder of that. 
Uh, and so I think uh, a well-coordinated national security strategy is really what we need. It's no longer just a foreign policy. Um, and I think that Ukraine crisis has shown that Britain still has major strengths in that area, and that's what we've got to build on. I will stop there to leave as much time as we can for questions, uh, Maeve. That's great. Thank you very much. So lots and lots of food for thought here. Um, you see, yeah, so much to get into. I, I've seen there's some questions coming through in uh, the Q&A, so I will come to those in just a minute. But just to, to draw it all together a little bit, we've, we've heard a lot of different things, and, and I think you've all highlighted in different ways some of the stresses that the, um, that, that the Foreign Office, the FCO, and the FCDO has been under in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the last few decades. Obviously, this, this includes changes in that wider strategic context, um, and, and I, you know, as, as you've all pointed to, a series of, of crises and shocks, kind of body blows, really, to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the department and, and to its kind of uh, sense of mission and purpose. And so, um, Peter, you do well to highlight the extraordinary impact, I think, of some of these budget cuts and the timing of the budget cuts with the merger. I mean, it's obviously, it's, a, it's a, 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 um, a permanent feature of governance that you have to deal with, you know, with, with constrained budgets and you can't afford to do everything you want to do all of the time. But I think you're right to point out the extraordinary nature of that, trying to achieve something really quite substantial and structural terms at the same time as major budget cut uh, is, is something that should be um, really considered in, in quite a nuanced way. Um, Suzanne, I, I appreciated your point about the targeted use of ODA, and I'd love to, to talk a little bit about this, this kind of relationship um, between the different elements of what, uh, what the Foreign Office uh, the FCDO uh, is for and it, its role um, and, and the, 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 strength, the, the strengths and weaknesses of using um, uh, different arms of foreign policy in different ways and trying to draw together something, say, a slightly more integrated strategic offering. Uh, I think there'll be some questions uh, on that too. Um, I think this question of, like, of making foreign policy and the the, uh, the extent of the kind of trade-offs and uh, and the choices that need to be made. I mean, this was all true at the time of publishing the IR. It was, it was quite clear that a number of trade-offs were going to need to be made. And, and you're right to point out that these are, aren't um, in the document. And I'm interested in in how in in the year since the publication of that and um, circumstances have changed, like the wider operating environment in which we're trying to, to implement um, strategy. And how, and how the FCDO, its role in implementing bits of that strategy is just more sharply uh, important to make some of these choices, but in the context of this deteriorating economic and, and security context, a global food crisis, energy crisis, and possibly, you know, a, a Taiwan crisis coming down the pipes and, um, sooner than we, than we might have um, expected. I think it's fair to say that the trends identified in the integrated review um, have held up probably, which is that we're seeing acceleration towards those trends. And I think we're also seeing uh, a convergence of the Indo-Pacific and Euro-Atlantic um, strategic theatres. I think they were always very innately tied together, but um, recent events have made it harder and harder to disentangle those two uh, and to, to not see them as one um, strategic theatre. And of course, overarching all of this and any crisis that we could possibly point to is the uh, the common climate crisis. So it seems to me that, you know, that um, uh, you, you've pointed out some real major successes um, in, in the last, um, in the last 10 years Tom uh, and the ways in which the um, uh, the evolution and the, the learning from various different reviews has has brought some really really positive changes um, positive structural changes and, and changes in terms of staffing and, and sort of demographic um, and some of the skills and capabilities um, one question for all of you before we, we, we turn to the questions in the Q&A is um, around this strategic theatre of the Indo-Pacific and you know, the, the question of how we, um, uh, both in Britain and, and in terms of um, uh, NATO allies and, and, and elsewhere, how, how that challenge um, of, um, uh, of China, perhaps a kind of a converging Russia and China axis, how that has shifted foreign policy thinking and planning and so it's kind of a, it's a sort of a strategic question around foreign policy national security strategy it's also a question around the machinery of making foreign policy and the resources that we have i mean the indo-pacific is a strategic theater where you know in, in, Fair to say, everybody um, who's, who thinks about international order thinks that this is where international order of the 21st century will be contested. Um, and you know, Britain is perhaps a little bit late to the to the table in terms of offering Indo an Indo-Pacific strategy. So this is a space that we're going to be talking about probably with increasing intensity in the coming years. And I guess the question, some of the questions you were asked in the, in the preparation for this um, this conversation, was around the fitness for purpose of the machinery of foreign policy making and strategy making and implementation uh, in the FCDO itself. Um, 
yeah, specific question for you really. With all of this in mind, what, what adjustments would you make to make um, the FCDO more, more fit for purpose for operating in this really quite challenging and let's, let's face it, very distant strategic theatre? What, what are the specific adjustments that you would make or the specific sort of um, uh, changes you would make to the kinds of talent or training that, that we have in place? Things that will make us uh, more um, uh, agile, more resilient to change uh, in that particularly challenging context. Any thoughts from anyone? Um, over to you. I jump in um, quickly first then. Um, I, I, so just three quick thoughts, and in a way they, they pick up on, on points uh, Suzanne and Peter have made as well. I, when I worked in, in number 10, I, I desperately hoped that the closer I got to the center of power, eventually I would find a basement full of brilliant, cynical, sharp strategists um, having exactly these sorts of conversations and thinking about where we move resource, um, what can we, you know, what assets do we have to deploy uh, in different space, you know, what is the next crisis, what's the next crisis, uh, but one, as we heard uh, earlier. And I fear that, that actually the, the lesson of my time at the center was that that doesn't actually exist. Now, there are brilliant people in the front office writing those papers, having those thoughts, but I think it, it is often disconnected from, you know, to use, a, to use the phrase of Hamilton, the room where it happens. So how do you connect the sofa where it happens to that conversation? And I think the NSC architecture is probably the place to do it, but retaining in all of that, in that architecture, Suzanne's point about the element of surprise. Where, as, as you said that, Suzanne, I was trying to think in four years in number 10, was I ever surprised by a submission, a policy paper from the Foreign Office? And I'm not sure that I was. And I think that's, there's, a, there's a problem there. If they're not, not just surprising the world, but actually surprising ministers and the Prime Minister um, with policy uh, advice. And then final thought on this, uh, practical thought, getting the ambassador into the room is key to all this. Suzanne touched on the, on the sense that you know, is the ambassador really in control of the overall policy towards a country? I'm not sure, certainly in my, in my working life, the US AMBO is a great example of that because it's a very particular kind of role in Washington. But our ambassadors in the Indo-Pacific region could be. They do have the advantage of being able to see around the next corner. And even if they're not getting that much attention today, being prepared to be in the room for that conversation when it comes is really important. We always used to hear that Maggie Thatcher used to say, uh, I don't, I, you know, I really don't like the Foreign Office, but I really like the ambassadors. And I've heard subsequent prime ministers say the same thing. And te the technology now does allow us to get the AMBO into the National Security Council meeting or into the room effectively onto the screen with the PM at the key moment. So I think for the Foreign Office to wield the influence it can do, that would be a very practical, easy thing to get them in the room. Uh, yes, Suzanne. Thank you, Mayor. Obviously, if there was an easy answer, um, we wouldn't be in this mess. So um, uh, I'm going to have a go. Um, one of the lessons that we have learned consistently, actually, particularly in Afghanistan and Ukraine, is that we, we spend all our time understanding the opposition and we don't put the same amount of, of sort of thought and analysis into understanding ourselves and our allies. Um, and so one thing that I would definitely do on Indo-Pacific matters is not just analyze China, the adversary, but analyze all the other nation states who have a part to play in what's going on and really try and understand what their position is and what's going to affect their position. Then, I would think building on the sort of question of surprise, what you have to do if you're going to if you're going to if you want to if you want to get ahead of your opponents, and let's say that it's China, you have to think what actions might we take which would change their risk calculus. What is it that we can do that's going to make them think, oh, I don't want to take another island in the South China Sea, or I don't want to, you know, bully Indonesia anymore. You know, um, and I, that's the conversation that, that needs to be had. And I completely agree with Tom. That conversation needs to happen within the Foreign Office, but actually it, it would be a, mis a terrible mistake to only happen within the Foreign Office. It needs to happen across government. And, and one of the, I think one a pitfall the Foreign Office can fall readily into is, is to try and think it all through internally before it shares it with another department. I think, I think looking upwards and outwards has to be um the way it goes and and finally on ambassadors i think 
yes, but they can be over optimistic. So that question about understanding your allies and friends, the tendency for an ambassador is to always see something good about the place they've been sent to. And sometimes someone has to really challenge that and say, I know that you want the relationship with X country to be brilliant, but could it just be the case that in fact you're not right um, and we need to think about things completely differently? Um, Peter, do you have anything to add? I'm keen to come to the q and I'll just say, let's be realistic, the UK is never going to itself be able to influence events in the Indo-Pacific very dramatically. Um, China um, isn't going to take a great deal of notice of us alone. Our expertise is largely uh, in our intelligence relationships and our diplomatic relationships. British ambassadors tend to speak Chinese, Japanese, Korean uh, in a way that most other Western ambassadors don't. We know these countries, we can offer the Americans and the wider democratic community genuine expertise and depth, uh, real intelligence capabilities, and some niche defense capabilities as well. But we're only ever going to be a secondary player in the Indo-Pacific area, uh, and let's accept that reality. Great, thank you. And there is a question in the chat on the Indo-Pacific, which is, um, which relates to um, the possibilities of a future second Anglo-Japanese alliance, thoughts on British attitudes, I suppose that means uh, public British attitudes towards the Indo-Pacific region and the impact of British participation in the CPTPP this year or next year. Does anybody want to come in on any of those questions? A word about Japan perhaps. Um, uh, it's a natural ally for the UK and it's been great to see UK-Japanese relations improving a lot in recent years, um, economically, obviously, politically, uh, and in defense uh, as well. Now that Japan and the UK both have the F-35 fighter, we're both absolutely in the, in the top league of uh, uh, international air forces. Um, I mean, I think that the most interesting grouping, actually, in the Indo-Pacific area is this new uh, quartet, the Quad, um, US, India, um, and Japan and Australia and through close relationships with most of those players, all of them in a way, the UK ought to be in amongst the quartet discussions about security in Asia. And the fact that Japan has come out of its shell quite distinctively in the last few years, I think is a good thing. And therefore it is an area we should be building on. Mm. Okay, thank you. So we have a question from Louise Kettle about, uh, she points out, you know, Tom identified the FCDO sense of purpose proves to be missing, Suzanne identifies how and when that might have occurred, and Peter suggests that the NSC is the best place to think about strategy. But Louise's question is, I wonder if you, any of you have a sense of what Britain and the FCDO's purpose is or should be. Global Britain remains a vacuous phrase and the integrated review is so broad as to mean nothing. Uh, and can that be uh, led without political will or support? I, 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 I'd like to start by answering all my questions by saying I don't actually have the answer, but, um, but to, to come back to the, the point that I was trying to make about overseas development aid, I think what I was trying to get at was we really need to have a conversation about how we build alliances beyond the ones that we sort of take for granted and assume that are going to be there. And, um, and I think that we thought, even though we always, we, we weren't using aid for anything, but I think we did think, this is the means by which we make friends with the rest of the world. And for me, the really, one of the lessons that we've got to take from Ukraine is that we haven't made the kind of friendships that I think we wanted to have, even with countries like India, where we put quite a lot of effort in the Indo-Pacific to talk about that. So, so the question has to be, um, how do we, use all the tools at our disposal to, to make friends with the countries in the middle so that when they're forced to choose which they have been they just naturally tend towards siding with us rather than siding somewhere else and that's going to be the critical thing that we have to work on because as we've all acknowledged you know the problem in russia is going to get worse not better we should expect china seriously to challenge um the global order in different ways and and if we can't win the middle ground we're lost um thank you 
Um, just very briefly, because I think there's always a risk with them, um, with, the, the, with, with these sorts of efforts that we end up coming up with a, another soundbite, you know, trying to replace global Britain with a better soundbite. And it can, it can quickly get a little bit uh, vacuous. But I think the question really gets the heart of the challenge here, uh, which is to, in addition to Suzanne's points about, you know, the what and the how is the why, you know, why? Why are we doing this? Why does the Foreign Office exist in, uh, in 2022? And, and actually, that was the bit of the review I led that got taken out. Uh, I, I felt that we did need uh, a, a positive expression of what Britain did in the world. I, I can't remember what we came up with, but it was something around, you know, a stronger Britain in a better world. There, there was an idealistic element to it. Uh, and I'm, I'm very much at the idealistic end of the foreign policy spectrum. And that's probably a little bit unfashionable at the moment. Uh, but I, I do think there needs to be something, you know, there has to be a shining city on a hill to motivate people when they are doing a crisis evacuation or writing the strategy paper or, or, or dealing with the latest uh, budget cut or, or merger or, or difficult, uh, a difficult minister. So I'd love to see more of that. Um, I also think in the midst of all this, uh, we have to be careful not to lapse back just because we're in a very 20th century crisis into lapsing back into 20th century mechanisms and alliances and pacts uh, uh, and so on. I think really we're thinking about different ways of forming networks and uh, and partnerships and moving really from uh, a world that used to be very like a game of Tetris or very top down and easy to understand and structured into a world which is a bit more like Minecraft, which is a bit more chaotic and where you're forming alliances, different kinds of alliances, issue by issue. Great. And thank you. There are a few more questions about this question of instrumentalizing aid and a question from Sam Borney about um, the limited influence that uh, aid has had and the oft given reason that the countries, especially China, have um, have acquired more influence due to their development assistance funds coming with fewer conditions and the questions around whether UK's foreign aid is too conditional. There's also a point from George Prentice asking about, spec uh, could you speculate on the reasons why aid wasn't effective enough? Uh, is it because the aid wasn't enough? Um, that Russia had perhaps sent more aid or those countries simply didn't feel they needed to repay um, the aid that the UK provided because it wasn't instrumentalized. With my historian's hat on, I, I guess I wonder to what extent some of our aid uh, is landing in some countries where we have some, um, some post-imperial baggage perhaps, uh, and whether, there's a, whether we fully understand and appreciate how some of, the, some of these countries, um, where we have say further more ground to make up perhaps, or, um, or in, in other ways that some of these relationships for, um, are um, the, the, the um, the, uh, our potential ask to some of these countries might be complicated by domestic politics around and complicated by some of those histories, which are huge questions which we can't possibly get to in the next seven minutes, but that's uh, something to park. There, there are a few other questions in, in here I'd just like to call attention to and perhaps we'll see uh, what we can uh, cover in the remaining time. Um, Christopher Boston has asked, to what extent is the FCDO promoting a diplomatic solution to the conflict in Ukraine? Uh, and connected to that, I suppose, how good is the relationship between the FCDO, the MOD, Security Services, SIS, and Number 10? Is there any joined up thinking in this area? I think this is a really interesting question because obviously at the heart of the integrated review and uh, using other terminology in previous reviews, this question of integration, whole of government approaches, and so on and so on is, um, is a really kind of central feature to this. How near or far would you say we are from whole of government approaches or integration of effort, especially on the more difficult questions of foreign policy? Can I take a quick shot at that? I mean, I think the government has been very well integrated in the approach to and in handling of the uh, Ukraine war. Um, the intelligence community, um, along with the Americans, got it right with their assessment that Putin would go in and he would try to go in and take the whole country. And there was a very interesting um, diplomatic use of that by putting out the intelligence judgments in a way that we haven't done before. Um, didn't stop Putin acting, but it may have complicated his run up and it certainly gave people notice of what was going to happen. Um, so I think, I think it's been effective from that point of view. I mean, I challenge the notion that there will ever be a diplomatic solution uh, in Ukraine. I don't think the Russians are interested in a diplomatic solution. They're interested in generating leverage over the West of creating um, instability uh, around the uh, edges of NATO, frozen conflicts that they can exploit when they want to. I mean, I don't believe that there is a negotiated solution that will satisfy Putin or probably any likely Putin successor, and that we are in for a longish period now of hostility and having to deter Russia from coming back for more rather than imagining there will be a diplomatic settlement that takes things back to the 23rd of February. I just don't think that that is available. So I think we've got to get ourselves into a mindset where some 
some of these crises do not have solutions. They need to be managed and, they, uh, and the threat needs to be contained. And I think that's what we're looking at with Russia, which is quite a big mind shift from where we were. Uh, could, I, could I just yeah. add, because I, um, I think there's a tendency to hear the word diplomatic solution and think compromise, negotiated settlement with Putin. And this is kind of what I was getting to on the war of terror point. There is a diplomatic solution, which is through diplomacy, we build a network of alliances, including amongst, amongst countries who Putin is relying on to support him. And we use that, essentially, to, to change the decisions that Putin is making. Um, and and that's, the, that's, that's where you start thinking in a different way. We, you know, let's be really bold. What would it take to change the calculus of the countries that Putin thinks are his friends? That's where I would like to see us being really active. And I think, Tom, you know, you're, in your remarks at the beginning, you pointed to the question of whether, you know, institutionally, culturally, this is happening within the FCDO, whether conversations are in that more sort of technocratic adjustment type space, you know, looking for functional accommodations and, you know, getting back to the status quo in some way, versus some of those bigger ideas around, you know, yeah, like what, what is actually is the future world order that we're aspiring to and, and figuring out some of those principles, those kind of big worldview kind of questions of statecraft. Um, so, you know, I, and I think to, to your point, um, uh, Peter, you mentioned that you know, there's foreign policy taking place purely within um, within the foreign offices. Those days are probably gone, and and it's about the relationship between um, the NSC um, uh, and the FCDO. There are some questions about the um, about the future of that kind of institutional structure. Um, one about the relationship you know, between that diplomacy and national and um, strategic national security strategy. I think for the UK, and I suppose. There is a question implicit in that about, you know, it, 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 could you imagine an institutional shift where the NSC and the FCDO have a new relationship with each other or there's some sort of, uh, kind of new in institutional form that tries to merge that some of that together? And uh, conversely, there's a question around, is it likely that the FCDO will unmerge into its predecessor organizations or similar? And if, if you think that's likely, how likely? So I guess the question is around institution and form, you know, what might be some of the possible changes that would get us to a place where foreign policy making brings back some of these big ideas in-house back into the FCDO and has the influence to try to land these into the conversations at the highest levels of national security strategy making. Does anybody want to take a pass at that? Shall I just say two words and, and then leave, leave to Tom to, to wrap it up? Uh, I mean, the National Security Council structure is just a light coordinating structure um, to help departments um, get their act together and to put coordinated advice to ministers. So it's not in any sense a competitor to the, uh, the Foreign Office. It has 100 or 150 staff. It hasn't got the capacity to generate a lot of original ideas to compete in the way that the NSC bureaucracy in America competes with the State Department, the Defense Department. So the NSC is a way of the FCO multiplying and amplifying its good ideas, attracting buy-in from other government departments and getting ministerial sign off at the top level. Uh, that's what it should be doing. Uh, and it should not be seen as a threat in any sense. Uh, and it's not, I mean, merging it with the Foreign Office, I think doesn't work out because the idea is it should be the vehicle for the Prime Minister and his cabinet to exercise a coordinated, um, uh, you know, to produce a coordinated government position. Um, I think in the early days, some in the Foreign Office did see the NSC as a bit of a threat coming between them and ministers. And then they worked out that a good idea originating in the Foreign Office can um, attract attention, uh, resources, decision by ministers by using the NSC structure. So I think that that's the way it should, it should go. It's a question for each prime minister of how they want to use this structure. Of course, um, government structures flex with the uh, personal uh, working habits and the priorities of prime ministers. But I think that in current circumstances, the NSC is more important than ever. Thanks. Thank you. Pass over to Tom for the final word. Um, so just very briefly on that, I agree completely with Peter, and he, he's much better placed um, to, to look at that uh, that relationship between the FCO and the, uh, and the centre. I think one thing current uh, Foreign Office folk would say over the last few years is many, many of the top diplomats have been in those roles, including, of course, Peter. And so there isn't a natural competition or natural tension, uh, although an observation, many of us who then go to other departments then tend, tend to turn on the Foreign Office. 
uh, more than uh, the front office would, would perhaps want. I think in terms of the, the overall structures, the pendulum swings back and forth, doesn't it? And, and you'll have periods when you have a very powerful number 10, periods when you have a very powerful cabinet office. In some ways, a bit of churn between, the, between those different eras is not a bad thing. You know, a second term prime minister takes a, probably a more hands-on interventionist approach to foreign policy making than a, a first term one. I think it's quite possible to imagine an incoming government looking at the last few years and thinking, right, we need to grip all this. And, and, and to come to a positive point of the integrated review, uh, I thought it was good on the need to really have, to really understand the trade-offs between values and interests. And, and I suppose what we're really talking about is where do you have that conversation? And I think when the system doesn't work, you're having that conversation on a sofa or in one department or actually just in Whitehall. Uh, but where you can have a room that brings together these different voices and actually argues out that conversation, then I think you have a much more effective national foreign policy. So that's the bit of it that I'd, I'd like to see us get right uh, in the next phase. Excellent. Thank you very much. That is an excellent note to end on. Um, I realise we are two minutes over and I know people need to, uh, to get going, so I will not linger on lengthy goodbyes and thank yous. But thank you so much to all our panel. Thank you to Ali and Abby. Uh, at CGS for setting all this up and thank you to our attendees for some excellent and thought-provoking questions. We look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye.